السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمد و نستعین و نست و فر و نعمن بہی و نہ توکل علیہ و نہ اود بلّہ من شرور انفسنا و من سیات مالنا مئی یہ دہ اللہ فلا مدل و میت اللہ فلا ہادی اللہ و نشد اللہ اللہ وحد لا شریق لہ و نشد ان محمد ابد و رسول ربش رحلی صدری و یسر علی امری یب کہو خولی ویلکم ٹو اور نیکسٹ سیشن آف دی سیرا سیریز ان دا پریویس سیشن وی ہیڈ ڈیلٹ اباؤٹ دی ایئر آف سیڈنیس فار دا پروفٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اینڈ آل دا پرابلمس دیٹ ہی ویل ٹو تھرو ہز وائی ہز وزٹ ٹو تائف اینڈ آل دیٹ ہیٹ ہیپن اینڈ دا گریٹسٹ لیسن وی لرن فرام دیٹ از ڈو ناٹ کمپلین اباؤٹ ادرس کمپلین اباؤٹ یور اون سیلف in case you get into any difficulty now proceeding now we will go for the isra wal mi'raj now this is one of the most profound and landmark events in the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as we know the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had taken so many major hits one after the other one after the other and uh, understandably he was extremely overwhelmed by the circumstances as a human being the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was being beat down it was this event happened about a year and a half before he, he migrated to madina so at this moment in the sira of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he embarked on what we call as al isra wal mi'raj which was one of the most profound events in the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now usually look at it in a, a human way when our children face a lot of difficulties and they struggle for the exams and they uh, have so much of efforts done d- during and before the exams the parents see the child who is suffering so much and what do they promise the child you finish this exams i will take you out for a trip the very idea of being taken out for a trip somewhere out of the place gives them the boost for them to study more anticipating what is going to come ahead now this is one of the it's it cannot be exactly compared but this is one of the beautiful ways where the allah subhanahu wa taala takes him out of this and calls him to, for a meeting with allah himself Alhamdulillah. Now, Isra and Mi'raj are two different words. Isra means a travel that occurs during the night. And this was the travel in the night that the Prophet ﷺ undertook from Makkah to Jerusalem, which, where the Baitul Muqaddas was. You understand? Mi'raj is actually the ascension towards heavens. so these are two different things uh, mehraj comes from the word uh, root word uruj which literally means to ascend to go upwards mehraj also means a mechanism or a means by which one ascends one goes up in this uh, sira terminology we refer to this as the actual ascension of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the heavens alhamdulillah this particular incident has been referred by allah twice in the quran once in surah isra surah number 17 ayah number 1 which reads the interpretation exalted is he who took his servant at night by night from al masjid al haram to al masjid al aqsa whose surroundings we have blessed to show him of our signs indeed he is the hearing the seeing now there are many narrations from about 
20 Sahaba about this journey of Isra wal Mi'raj. You will not find in other hadiths where there are many Sahaba saying the same thing. Here it is quite different. And one thing is we must understand they don't necessarily contradict with each other. It is only the interpretation that they have between each other and probably a couple of minor variations. So, but even those that we find there, the minor variations have simple explanations once you get to know them by depth in trying to understand what the circumstances were. But in all major details, there are no contradictions. Uh, please keep this in mind. Uh, there have been problems in the presentation of details regarding this Isra well Me'araj. The reason is, firstly, as I said earlier, there are numerous ahadith that are talking about this. The second reason is people take undue advantage of this event and you find a lot of exaggerations by storytellers in the earlier times. And those people were very well known for exaggerations. They were very well known for fabrications, how they used to fabricate the hadith. Now, these people who used to fabricate and make a huge drama out of it were actually unscrupulous people who used to do it only for money. Usually there's an audience, somebody starts talking in the audience and the way he presents it, the drama he creates, the people get so moved that they give him money. The more he makes a drama, the more money he gets. So that is why their stories became very popular, especially in the second and third generation of Islam, until the scholars started putting an end to this. However, there were still remnants of these fabrications and exaggerations that still have crept in into the uh, story of the Prophet ﷺ on his visit for Isra well Me'araj. So one of the things is, it has become a very big problem to piece together the chronological narration. When this particular thing happened, after this what happened, after this happened, the chronological order, it was very difficult for many scholars to put it down in the proper order. You understand? There are snippets about the story elsewhere, but it's very difficult to verify which happened first, which happened next, which happened where especially in this particular uh, journey. Sometimes what one scholar says about the Sira is different from what another scholar says. It is mainly because so many narrations and different details about Isra well Me'raj have come up. Some scholars, including scholars like Imam al nabawi and Ali, Ibn Abi Jaramra, they actually thought there were to Israel well Mehraj. Probably it happened twice. However, the majority opinions is that there was only one Israel well Mehraj because Allah has clearly mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al Isra, Laylan. Laylan means one night, one singular night. So it is clear that there was only one Israel well Mehraj. And if there are any discrepancies, we try to reconcile that particular thing. Now, some of the scholars, the classical scholars of the Sira, who have taken all these pieces, searched for the authentic narrations, and then made an attempt to piece them all together so that a more flowing and a better uh, flowing of what actually transpired on the night of Israel well Mehraj can be understood in a better manner. Allah alone knows the truth. In this presentation, I have tried my best to refer to different sources and I did face some difficulty in consolidating and compiling the same. May Allah forgive me for any mistakes that I have made. All I can say is, Allahu A'lam. Can we have the next slide, please? Yes.
So this is the map of the journey of how the Isra took place. Not the Miraj, the Isra moving from Makkah to Bait al -Muqdas. The next slide, please. So the journey begins. The Prophet said, when I was in my house, that is actually where Ummahani stayed, I saw the roof opened up and Jibreel salam, came to me. The house was very near the Kaaba in those days. Nowadays, if you look at the Kaaba and the surroundings, everything looks far away. But in those days, the houses were very close to the Kaaba. You know, the Hatim area where that circumference is there, half circle is there, Hatim, very near to that were some of the houses. So this was one of the places where the Prophet ﷺ was and Jibreel Islam had come to him. So what did Jibreel ﷺ do? He first took the Prophet ﷺ to the Kaaba where the Prophet ﷺ prayed two rakats and from there, the journey of Isra started. Before the journey could start, Jibreel alayhi salam washed the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, there are some narrations which actually say there were two angels present along with the Jibreel alayhi salam throughout the journey of Isra. Uh, it is very difficult to verify which is right and which is wrong, but I'm going more by the majority who say that only Jibreel alayhi salam had come. Again, Allah knows best. And it is also said that his heart was cleaned up three times and each time for a particular reason. Uh, Allah knows best, so I'm not going into those details. The basic purpose of washing the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam for, is because what he is about to see. If another man were to have seen even a fraction of what the Prophet ﷺ had seen, he would have gone mad. He would not have been able to bear that. So in order to help the Prophet ﷺ to understand and bear the journey, Jibreel ﷺ cleaned his heart. So by, what, by Isra and Mi'raj, what happened? The Prophet ﷺ entered a totally different world and he entered a totally different dimension. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, then Jibreel ﷺ brought me a dabba, which is the name of a beast or an animal. It is smaller than a mule, but larger than a donkey. The color was pure white and it was called al burakh And this word burakh comes from the root word Barak, which means lightning. It is to show how fast this particular Burak used to travel. It, if it puts his hoof at one place and it jumps, it jumps, the next foot goes to as far as the eye can see. Now, here is where the exaggeration started. The image of the Burak was sort of made. And different, different descriptions of how he moved were given. And some even say that the Burak had wings. You understand? There were no such things. There were no wings on the Burak. And the second part is, many of them draw the image of the Burak with a human head, with a face, human face. This is also totally false. Let us not fall into all these things. May Allah help us in this. The Prophet ﷺ said, I rode him and he took me until we reached Bait al -Maqdas. Once we reach there, the burak is tied to a post. Like you, how you would uh, tie any animal, like a camel or any such thing or a horse, the burak was tied to the post. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, I went inside Masjid al-Aqdas and I prayed two rakat. Now remember, this two rakat which he prayed was much before the Tahiyat al-Masjid was announced. Tahiyat al-Masjid was legislated in Madinah much later. This shows 
that the Prophet was practicing things that were not yet legislated, legislated for the Ummah. And then the Prophet continues, I saw myself with the other Prophets. And there was Musa salam praying. He was a tall, strong and muscular man of a brownish color, like someone from the tri tribe of Shanua. Then he says, I saw Maryam, uh, Isa ibn Maryam, Isa salam standing and praying and the one who looks like Isa is Urwa ibn Masud al Takhafi. The Prophet Sallallahu is trying to make the Sahaba understand how these people look like. He was trying to describe to his Sahaba. And the Prophet Sallallahu also said his hair glistened with water as if he had come out of a steam bath. And he is a rather short man compared to Musa Islam. This is about Isa Islam. And then he says, I saw Ibrahim Islam standing and praying. And the one who resembles his, him most is your own companion, which is the Prophet Wasallam himself. Meaning that the Prophet himself was, and the Ibrahim Islam were more similar images, like mirror images of each other in their physical appearance. And then the Prophet says, it, the time came for Salah and I was made the Imam of the Jamaat. Now, this shows the importance of Salah. Even after death of the Prophet, even after death, the Prophets are praying. Can you imagine? In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, when I was on Isra, I passed by the grave of Musa Islam, and I saw him standing and praying there. This means the Prophet ﷺ actually saw Musa Islam three times. One during Isra, one at Bayt al Maqdis, and the next when he went to the sixth heaven on Miraj. After Musa Islam was seen at his grave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took Musa Islam to Bayt al Maqdis, and from there Allah took him to the sixth heaven to greet the Prophet. And here Musa Islam did not need a burakh or any such thing because he was in a spirit form, not in a human form, basically. And in fact, the Prophet became the Imam of all the Prophets who stood there for the Salah at Bayt al -Maqdis. This clearly shows that the Prophet had been given an unparalleled and unequaled honor. Not only is he called a Sayyid al Ambiya and Imam al Mursaleen, but also the leader of all the Ummas, all the followers of all the prophets that came before him. He is the leader of his own Ummah and also the leader of all the Ummas that came before him under the other prophets. And another point is that the scholars say that the prophets are the, the prophets, I'm sorry, the prophets were all standing in one single row. Now, just imagine, 120,000 plus prophets that we have been told about, plus about 310 messengers, all in one single row. If they were in the form of human beings, it would not have been possible to make such a long row. But since they were in the spirit form, it was very easy for them. You understand? So this is another beautiful scene, a scene that had come across there. And the Prophet ﷺ leads the Salah. All the Prophets are in one particular row. And you can see in Surah number 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah number 285, We make no distinction between any of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messengers. And in another sense, if you go to the same Surah, Surah Bakra, Surah number 2, Ayah number 253, I'm sorry. 
تلك الرسل فضلنا بعضهم على بعض these messengers some of them we cause them to exceed others this is the will of allah indeed the prophets all pray to allah their message was the same to all their people but amongst themselves amongst the prophets some prophets are better than the other prophets and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the best among all of them can we have the next slide please the slide after that yeah milk versus wine after the salah was over the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said jibril alaihi salam presented two utensils to me in one of the utensils there was milk in the other there was wine now remember at this time when the wine was shown to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the ayah of prohibition of wine had not been revealed it had not been wine had not been made haram at that particular time jibril alaihi wasallam hands over the two utensils to him and says choose and accordingly choose for your ummah that means the choice you make will affect not just you but the entire ummah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam chose milk and jibril alaihi salam said you have chosen the fitra and there's a huge symbol for us here this fitra and another thing is before i go to the fitra there's a lot of difference between milk and wine let's look at it a little way milk comes from pure from the animal like you see in surah an-nahl surah number 16 ayah number 66 and verily in the cattle there is a lesson for you we give you to drink of that which is in their bellies from between excretions and the blood pure milk palatable to the drinkers and in a hadith it is said nothing substitutes for both food and drink other than milk so milk in itself is a blessed delicacy that allah mentions in the quran and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam praised and used to love it as we know it's nourishing and nutritious but what about wine wine is compared how is wine made it is fermented and they said it's fermented it is filthy it is already corrupted it is something that was pure and then bacteria infested it and then the wine was, was formed and wine literally stinks what does it do is it really nourishing is it really wholesome no it corrupts you it makes you to act foolish one of the sahaba said wallahi even if wine had not been pro- prohibited any intelligent man would have avoided it now compare and contrast what is milk and what is wine the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam chose what is pure what comes from the pure and sustains you purely versus wine which is corrupt it is corrupted and it also corrupts the body and what did jibril alaihi salam say this is for your umma your umma will be pure upon the fitra now as we all know fitra is implanted into us the moment we are born fitra is that thing which we call as consciousness nobody need to tell us what is right and or wrong your fitra itself will tell you this is right and this is wrong nobody need to teach you even a small child knows what is right and wrong unfortunately we do not build ourselves from the fitra we put the fitra aside and then we try to reason out and as a result of which we get into so many complications trying to know what is right and what is wrong there is a hadith which says every child is born upon the fitra which means every child is pure and good 
which means again, the base instinct of a human being is good. It is not evil. How many ever of us ever bothered to make use of this Pitra in us? That inner voice that keeps telling us this is good and this is bad, it helps us from what is right and what is wrong. So it is only by the awakening of your fitra that your iman can increase. And through this increase of iman, you can develop your taqwa and ultimately have that tawakkul on Allah. The complete trust and unconditional trust in Allah. Can we have the next slide? So the journey of Isra is complete. Now Al-Mi'raj is what starts. The ascending through the gates of heavens. So again, remember, the burakh is tied to the post because after Mi'raj, the Prophet ﷺ will have to come again, write the burakh and get back to his place. Now remember one thing. There are doors to the heavens. There are seven heavens. To each door, heaven, there is a door, and those doors are locked. Each door has a gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper, gatekeeper is not allowed to make anybody pass through this unless they have the permission. And again, remember, because these are angels that are moving, angels can never lie. There's no special code needed for the angels to pass through from one heaven to the other and get the permission of the gatekeeper. Jibreel al-Islam actually has to say, yes, I'm Jibreel, and he's allowed inside. It's not like these days where they say, an OTP will be sent to your mobile, please put fill in your OTP, and then only you'll be allowed to move further. Such things are not there. The Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel al-Islam asked permission for the door of the heaven to open. The gatekeeper asked, who is it? The answer was, it is Jibreel. Do you have anyone with you? Yes, I have with me Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He has been sent for. You understand? Then, does he have permission to pass? Is the question. Jibreel says, yes. And then the door opens up. And remember, this process takes place in every one of the heavens that he passes through. The same questions are asked, the same answers are given. Now, there's something interesting. What is the difference between Sama and Jannah? Sama in Arabic basically means a sky. And the plural of Sama is Samawat. The plural of Jannah is Jannat. This is how it is. Many people confuse Jannah with Sama. But these are two separate words and two separate concepts altogether. In uh, Surah 67, I think Surah Al-Mulk, Al Ayah number 3, Allah has mentioned Allah has created sub asamawatin tibaka. He created the seven samawat, one layer over the other, one layer over the other. Now, samawat are physical heavens above us. Physical uh, sort of levels above us, I should say. Everything we see around us now, that billions of stars and galaxies, and the huge sky that you see is actually only the first sky. Where it like requires billions of light years to go from one to another, one place to another. So can you imagine the size of the very first sama? Like this, there are seven, six other samas, total seven. So the first sama contains all the stars and the galaxies. It does not mean that the entire galaxies fill up even up to the seventh level. No, it's not right. So how we get this opinion? Again, in the same surah, Surah Tul-Mulk, Ayah number five, we have, uh, well, uh, well, I can't, I'm sorry, we have beautified asama ad-dunya bimasabiha. 
what Allah says, he has beautified the very first sky with lamps. He did not say all the skies. Then again in Bukhari, the Prophet said, Jibreel Islam took me until we finished the Sama Ad Dunya, which is the first sky. And then he asked for permission for the door to open to the next Sama. And then beyond said Sama Ad Dunya, there are other Samas. Now, what are Jannat? And where are they? The Jannat, plural Jannat, are the gardens, paradise that are promised as the reward for the believers. May Allah make us also one of them. Amen. There are two interpretations. One interpretation is that Jannat consists of hundreds and thousands of layers and all these occupy the seventh heaven. Okay. Another interpretation says is that Jannah actually begins with the sixth heaven and works its way upwards to the seventh heaven. And there is evidence for both. But all this is part of the ilmul ghaib, the unseen. So what is the bottom line? Don't question this. Jannat is above the samawat is what we have to take. Care. Now, why does Allah, again you will find when the Prophet ﷺ is going to on the Miraj, he meets different prophets at different levels of the sama. The question arises, why did Allah place different prophets in each of the sama during the Miraj of the Prophet ﷺ? There appears to be some wisdom in this order. Let's have a look at it. Realize this order. And contrary to the popular misconception that many people had, it has nothing to do with the blessings of the prophets. It is not because some prophet has a lesser blessing that he's put in the lower sky and another prophet has a greater blessing and put on the other sky. No, it has no connection with that at all. Some people have the wrong conception that Adam alayhi salam had the least blessing. That was he was, that's why he was put in the lower sky. Please remove such misconceptions from your mind. Actually, these prophets are the basic welcoming committee to the Prophet Allah sent some of the noblest and most famous prophets to simply greet the Prophet as he comes in. The Prophet is being given a royal, what we would call as a red carpet welcome. And in each of these skies that he visits, the prophets who are there, there is wisdom behind it. Again, remember, these Samawat are not Jannah. Keep that in mind. Right now, they have been taken from their places, brought to these levels of the skies to welcome the Prophet ﷺ. Otherwise, they will still be in their graves, except for Isa salam, praying and standing there and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I said, the only exception is Isa salam, who had to come down to meet the Prophet This is a symbolic indication since Isa salam, will ultimately come down to the dunya near the end of the times, before the Akhira. So remember one thing, Jannah is not occupied at all since what Adam salam, was there and left. And they won't be occupied till after Khiyama. You must have known about the Barzakh. That will give you an idea. Next slide, please. Can we have the first heaven? We go to the first heaven, first summer. There was a man standing there. The Prophet ﷺ described him as being tall and huge. Jibreel salam said, This is your father. Adam alayhi salam. So say salam to him. So the Prophet salam did so and Adam alayhi salam responded, welcome O noble son and O noble Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. It is befitting that he is the first to greet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam 
because he is the father of all, not only the Prophet but of all mankind. And in one narration, it is said that the Prophet saw that there were people on the Adam Islam's left and on his right. And whenever Adam Islam would look to the right, he would sound happy, he would smile. When he looked towards his left, he used to begin to cry. So the Prophet ﷺ asked Jibreel salam, what is this? The reply was, these are all the children of Adam salam. The people on the right are the, the people of Jannah. The people on the left are the, are the people of Jahannam. May Allah make us all among the people of the right. Amen. And by seeing Adam salam, what you remember is that he was a man whom Allah chose first with Jannah. But then he had to leave Jannah to face the trials in the dunya. And eventually, he will be returning to Jannah. So this is a symbol for all of us also. Let's go to the second heaven, inshallah. Now there in the second heaven, there was Yahya and Isa, alayhim salam. He was told, Prophet was told, this is Yahya and this is Isa, say salam to them. So the Prophet did so and they said, welcome, O noble brother and O noble prophet. Now Adam said, O noble son and O noble prophet. Here it is, O noble brother and O noble prophet. So these are perfect second candidates because they are chronologically the closest to the Prophet No Prophet came after Yahya and Isa until the Prophet came. So they are the peers. Again, there's a symbol here. Both of them, people tried to kill both of them. They succeeded in killing Yahya As per the own New Testament that they have in the Bible, they cut his head off at Baitul Maqdas. They even tried to kill Isa alayhi salam. So here also there's a symbol for us. Allah is telling the Prophet wasalam, that he isn't the only one whom people tried to harm. The next heaven, please, the third heaven. There was Yusuf alayhi salam and it was the same dialogue that took place. And here is where the Prophet said the most famous statement, I saw Yusuf and lo and behold, it was as if he had been given half of all beauty. His own blood brothers, Yusuf al-Islam's own blood brothers tried to harm him. Eventually they repented and accepted him back. So again, there is a symbol here for the Prophet. Your own blood relatives are going to go against you. You will be expelled by your own relatives, but you shall always come back eventually. And again, Subhanallah, who did the Prophet Sallallahu quote when later on, when he conquered Makkah? The Quraysh asked him, what will you do with us now? And then, in Surah Yusuf, uh, Surah number 12, Ayah number 92, the Prophet ﷺ recites the same Ayah. No blame will be upon you today. Allah will forgive you. SubhanAllah. Shall we go to the next slide, please? The fourth heaven. In the fourth heaven, he was welcomed by Idris salam. Again, he said, welcome, O noble brother. Welcome, O noble Prophet The only thing that we know about Idris is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him in Surah Maryam, Surah number 19, Ayah number 56. The only thing he has mentioned is, we have raised him to a high place. And that's all we need to know. Our sallallahu alayhi wa is also being told, if you go to Surah number 94, we have raised your rank. 
This is what the Prophet was told by Allah. Let's go to the next heaven, please. And there in the next heaven, there was Harun alayhi salam. The same thing transpired between the both of them. Harun alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam both have similar reasons. Both were despised by their own people and eventually they were accepted. The sixth heaven, please. There was Musa alayhi salam. The same things are exchanged. And there are some narrations which say that the Prophet described Musa alayhi salam as being stout, tall, muscular, and brownish. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, why did Musa alayhi salam cry when he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam? When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam went up towards him, Musa alayhi salam began to cry. He was asked, why are you crying? So Musa alayhi salam says, I'm crying because this young man, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he calls him the ghulam, somebody who's young, who was sent after me shall have a larger following that will enter Jannah than my own Ummah. It's a sort of a jealousy, but it's an Islamic jealousy which is allowed. We can, we can and we should be positively jealous of our people who are excelling themselves in their hasanat, in their journey towards Jannah. We can be that. Remember, the age of the Prophet ﷺ at that time was around 51 or 52 years. Musa Islam died after he was 130 plus, 130 years plus. So the Prophet ﷺ is still like a young boy in the eyes of Musa Islam. And Musa Islam has the second largest ummah after our Prophet. ﷺ. And he is the one that has the most similar experiences to our Prophet ﷺ. There's not much difference between the experiences of Musa ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ. His experience is unrivaled amongst the Prophets. And in many authentic ahadis, the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned, indeed, Musa was hurt more than I was. But he was still patient to continue to remind himself, the Prophet used to mention this all the time. Now we go to the seventh heaven. The Prophet ﷺ said, I saw Ibrahim salam, and he was sitting with his back leaning to Baitul Ma'amur. Then again, Jibreel ﷺ told me, this is your father Ibrahim salam. Say salam to him. So the Prophet ﷺ did so. And how did Ibrahim ﷺ respond? He says, welcome, O noble son, O noble Prophet ﷺ. See the way of greeting is changed here. Only Adam and Ibrahim ﷺ responded in this way. The rest, everyone said, brother, brother, welcome, O noble brother. The, so the Prophet ﷺ is being shown his own ancestor, who has the highest place among all the prophets? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam was indeed very high. He was Kalimullah. Ibrahim alayhi salam was even higher, Khalilullah. And the Prophet salam, is the Habibullah. Subhanallah. The Prophet salam, said, Allah has only taken me and Ibrahim as Khalil. So only two people reach this stage, his status. The fact that Ibrahim salam, is leaning against Baitul Ma'mur, which is also known as the most frequented house, is very appropriate. Now, let's see what Baitul Ma'mur is. If you go to Surah Tur, Surah number 52, Ayah number 4, the mention, well, Baitul Ma'mur, Allah has taken an oath on the Baitul Ma'mur. In an authentic hadith, there are different versions, but the, in an authentic hadith, the Prophet said, it is the Kaaba of the heavens, positioned 
right above the Kaaba and the earth, such that if it were to fall, it would fall on directly on the Kaaba of the earth. And every single day, since Allah has created all the creation, 70,000 angels enter Baitul Ma'amur, they do the tawaf, they make dua, and they never return. They just proceed on after that. Every single day this happens. Can you imagine the total count of the number of angels just based on this one scene? Ibrahim al Islam is the one who built the Kaaba on the earth. So it is only befitting that he should be associated with the Kaaba on the, in the heaven. Next slide, please. Now we come to Sridratul Muntaha. The Prophet then proceeded above, onward above the seventh heaven after seeing all these prophets. And he said, then Jibreel Islam continued going up with me until we came to Sridratul Muntaha. It was enveloped with colors. He says, I don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says in the Quran, Surah, Surah Najan, Surah number 53, Ayahs 16 to 18, when there covered the Sidratul Muntaha, which, that which is covered, that which covered it. The sight of the Prophet did not swerve, nor did it transgress its limits. He certainly saw the greatest signs of his Lord. Ayatul Kubra. So the tree is not a static tree, it's a dynamic, majestic tree that's something out of the world and it is constantly changing colors. Allah does not tell us specifically what the colors are. But it will be interesting to note that the colors there are beyond the spectrum that we know of. You know that vibgyar, the white light comes out in different colors. It is not, it's much more, much more than that. And so the Prophet is seeing colors that cannot be seen in the world. So the fact that the Prophet is seeing colors that only can be generated by different types of light shows that he is definitely in some other place during the mirage. So by viewing Siddhatul Muntaha, Allah is telling the Prophet Wasallam, look at one of my magnificent creations. Now, if you look at from the Arabs' point of view, when you say Sidra to them, what comes to their mind is mentioned as something as a very wide tree that grows in a desert. It's known to have huge branches and it covers a wide area. And it is known for its delicious fruits and also its sweet scent. So, muntaha means intaha till the very end. So, Sridratul muntaha is said as the tree at the very end. The Prophet said the fruits of this tree were as large as the water jars that the people of Hajar used to carry at that time. And the leaves are like the years of elephants. In Sahih Muslim, Abdullah ibn Masood says, the Prophet said, I stopped at Sridhatul Muntaha. It is in the sixth heaven. Everything that is raised up from the earth, that is your duas, prayers, good deeds, good words, etc. Stop at Sridhatul Muntaha. It absorbs all of this. And from Siddhatul Muntaha emanates, descends everything that comes down, which is Allah's Rahma, rain, etc. And the, when the tree is enveloped in this manner, there will be butter, butterflies made out of gold there. Such is the position. Some of the scholars say the Siddhatul Muntaha is in the seventh heaven, some say it's at the sixth heaven. There is no contradiction between this because the beginning of Siddhartha Muntaha is actually starting from the sixth heaven and moves on to the seventh heaven. Next slide, please. We now go to the four rivers. 
The Prophet said, at the base of Siddhat al-Muntaha are four rivers that are coming down. Two of them are hidden and two are open. So I asked Jibreel alayhi salam, what are these rivers? Jibreel alayhi salam says, as for the hidden ones, they are the ones which are in Jannah. And you can't see them from dunya. No human eye can see that at all. What are they? One is al kawthar You go to Surah number 108, Ayah 1. Inna kawthar And next in Surah Al-Insan, Surah number 76, Ayah number 18, from a fountain within paradise, which is named as Salsabil. As for the ones that everybody can see, the reference is made to the Nile River and the Euphrates River. From this we realize that the Nile and Euphrates are blessed rivers. SubhanAllah. And you will also observe the cradle of civilization has always been associated with these two rivers. The earliest civilization was basically Mesopotamia, which is associated with Euphrates. And the other one is associated with Nile. These two rivers from the beginning of time have always been rivers of life and civilization. Jibreel alayhi salam said, both rivers are from the blessings of Allah and everybody can see that. They emanate from up, but apparently only the people of the dunya can see it in the dunya. The next slide, please. Now, we come to more details. A little bit of caution I want to mention about this. It's almost impossible to piece together the events of Isra Val Mehraj chronologically. We simply have a collection of ahadis. Therefore, from this point onwards, we will be mentioning a few events, a few happenings, etc. But please don't take it for granted that it is in a proper chronological order. It's just a series of incidents that we are going to look into now. Now we go to the gatekeeper of Jahannam, Malik. It is narrated that the Prophet ﷺ met Malik, the gatekeeper of Jahannam. His name is mentioned in the Quran, Surah Zukhruf, Surah number 43, Ayah number 77. The interpretation reads, and they will cry, O Malik, the gatekeeper of hell, let your Lord make an end of us. Just kill us. He will say, verily, you shall abide here forever. No, you will live in Jahannam forever, facing all the punishments. Now, one beautiful thing, the Prophet ﷺ did not visit Malik while he was on duty. While Malik was on duty, no. He did not visit the uh, angel Malik at the gate of uh, Jahannam. No. Rather, Malik was brought to him to say salam to the Prophet Now, why was Malik brought to the Prophet One of the wisdoms that we can derive from here is to emphasize that the Prophet is far, far, far away from the fire of hell. hell. As far as the seventh heaven is away from the rest of the creation, the most bottom of the creation, that is the earth. Jibreel alayhi salam told the Prophet sallallahu to give salam to him. So the Prophet greeted him by saying salam. But before he could say anything, Malik told him salam first. And naturally, the Prophet sallallahu returned his salam. The thing is that Malik is associated with Jahannam. And that is why Malik was the first to say Salam. To show that there is no relationship at all between the Prophet and the Hellfire. To clearly show the distance and the superiority of the Prophet he cannot even come anywhere close to Jahannam. And Malik seemed very sad. He never smiled. 
So the Prophet ﷺ asked Jibreel Islam, why is he not smiling at all? Why is he looking so sad? The answer is, he has never smiled or laughed since he has been created. Where he has to smile at anybody or for anybody, it would have been only for you, Prophet ﷺ. His association of guarding Jahannam has made him so somber that he has never smiled or laughed ever since he has been created. Inshallah, we will proceed in the next session. We will continue with the other events that take place during Miraj while the Prophet ﷺ returned from Miraj and inshallah after that is returned to Makkah. Now we'll go to the duas inshallah. I have changed the duas for your convenience. Uh, you would like to, you may like to by heart them and also repeat them as much as you can inshallah. Inshallah. The duas start with Allahumma ahsin aqibatina fil umuri kulliha wa ajirna min qizya dunya wa adab al akhira. Oh Allah, make our final outcome in all matters. Let the final outcome be good and good only. And save us from the disgrace of this world and the torment of the hereafter. Next to us, please. Allahumma inni as'aluka al huda wa taqa wal afafa wal rina. A very short but very beautiful dua. It's easy to memorize this. Oh Allah, verily, I ask you for guidance. I ask you for piety. And I ask you for abstinence from all the things that are extreme. From show off. From a lot of the things that are not uh, liked by Allah. Next thing. Next dua. Allahumma in me as'aluka hubbak wa hubba may yuhibbuk wa hubba kullu amalin yuqarribni ila hubbik subhanallah subhanallah it will be nice if each one of us keep on reciting this in every dua of us in every sajda of us how beautiful the meaning is oh allah i ask you i beg you of your love and the love of those who you love and the love of every deed of mine that would draw me closer to your love. May Allah accept it from all of us. The next last one. Rabbi, a'uzu bika min hamazati shayateen wa a'uzu bika rabbi ayin yahdurun. This is from Surah Al-Mu'minun, ayahs number 97 and 98. Oh my Rabb, I seek refuge in you from the incitements of the devils and I seek in you, lest, refuge in you, lest they be present in me. Jazakumullah khairan. 